Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat and thank you for joining us on the ITV networks on this a very special episode of Finding Me. Mahatma Gandhi has been an inspiration to many. For the Indians in South Africa, he is a symbol of our struggle and a symbol of our freedom. And of his ten fundamentals, he has said, be congruent, be authentic and be true to yourself. And he also said that without action, you aren't going anywhere. Of course, this ties in with Islamic understanding that to say, just to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not enough. Besides the belief, there needs to be action. Otherwise, it's just um, lip service that you are paying to the religion. Thus, to claim that one supports any campaign of injustice or that one is against oppression, it's not enough to just verbally articulate. It is important for us also to extend our support through action. And the start to the eradication of injustice, of course, is to be first just with yourself and just with the people uh, who you encounter every day, the relationships that you are in and the people whose lives you share. And if any of you heard the interview with Hanif Hussain of the ID on, oh, sorry, of the DA the other day on Radio Islam, then you would have been shocked when you heard him say that the DA is neither pro-Palestinian nor pro-Israeli, but that it is pro-peace. What does pro-peace mean? And such a comment should have really offended many of us who truly understand the plight of the Palestinians. Because certainly, we are all for peace. The Palestinians are for peace. But what about justice? What about justice for the Palestinian people? So the question then is, Mr. Hussein and the DA, Will you support justice for the Palestinians and will you officially articulate that? And to talk about this and many other issues, I have with me today Susan Abul Hawa, the author of Mornings in Janin. And as we progress, I will speak to Susan more about herself so that you can get to know the wonderful personality that I have with me today. So welcome, Susan, and thank you very much for making this time. I know on a day that is supposed to be your off day, but for sharing and being here with us. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Um, you know, Susan, when I was reading your biography, it actually reads like a novella itself. Uh, in fact, I remember reading in one of the comments, somebody stated that one would almost believe the main character in uh, Mornings in Jardine actually is a biography of yourself. And, and then I read your answer from there. But just for the viewers so that they know, you were born to refugees of the Six Day War of 67 and your family's land was seized when Israel then captured the remaining of what remained of Palestine, including Jerusalem. So my question to you then as a starting point is, how have these experiences impacted on your development, firstly as a human being, and then secondly, as a Palestinian in exile? Well, you know, every person is a product of their history. Um, so it's uh, it's not something I can isolate and say, oh, well, this has had this impact and this has had that impact, um, because I, I have no other frame of reference other than being Palestinian, being um, an exile, uh, and you, you know this the whole this whole conflict for every Palestinian in one way or another has defined our existence. Um, I mean, you know, if you live under occupation. Your life is framed by the limitations of the occupation. Yeah. Likewise, if you live um, in a refugee camp, as Palestinians do, your, your life is likewise framed by the limitations um, of living in a refugee camp. Same thing you know, for, for Palestinians who are uh, refugees of the 1948 war. Uh, not refugees, I'm sorry, who, the 1948 Palestinians who remained in Palestine following the Nakba and became citizens of Israel. Um, uh, you know, they, they live as uh, fifth-class citizens, and of course, um, it, you know, that, that informs their lives and, and their identities as well. Um, for people like me, who are part of the, di of the diaspora, who live in exile, um, 
it, you know, you're, you're, you are separated from your roots um, and that frames your whole life. You know, it's not just your roots, but um, families who ended up in exile like I am um, tended to, to become scattered. So, you know, um, Palestinian society, like most Arab societies, the family structure is, um, is quite strong and, and large. So you often had, you know, three, four generations living in the same house, and at least in the same neighborhood, um, and everybody knows everybody. And that, that social structure was completely shattered and rearranged for, for the segment of the Palestinian population that I, that I belong to. So, you know, all of these things um, have, have shaped my life. And, um, you know, there were, there were personal things that resulted as a, as, um, as a consequence of the war, of, you know, the sort of disintegration of the family that, um, you know, put me in different situations in my life. So, uh, you know, I'm, I am a product of my life, period. <laughs> You know, when, as you were speaking, and you were speaking about the importance of family and society, I think a lot of South Africans will relate to that because a strength of the South African Indian Muslim society especially is about family and familial bonds. And many of those who emigrate, the thing that they will articulate all the time is, it's so difficult because there's no family. Mm -hmm. So I can just imagine how you felt because I do know Arab societies, they, they're big families mm -hmm. and they maintain these extended family bonds and yeah. it can be a challenge. Okay, so my, my next question to you then is, you moved to the USA as a teenager and you graduated in biomedical science. You established a career in medical science. But then in 2001, July, you founded Playgrounds for Palestine, a children's organization which is dedicated to the right to play for Palestinian children. Why is play important for you, in your understanding, when it comes to the development specifically of Palestinian children? Um, well, play is, is important for the development of all children. It, um, it's crucial for uh, not just physical development, but cognitive, social, and psychological development. Um, and in fact, there's, you know, there's a whole field of, of play psychology um, that, uh, that's, a, that's a, you know, a depth of, of study showing, um, showing the benefits of play. It's also uh, a right that's enshrined in the Universal Declaration of the Rights of the Child, um, that children have the right to play. But for children in conflict, it becomes particularly crucial because um, kids have all kinds of um, terror, aggression, fear, confusion, and uh, it's important to give them outlets for creative expression, for ways to, to sort of um, to make sense of, of what's in their internal world. Mm -hmm. um, and play is one of those, uh, is one of those outlets. Um, creativity, art is another, um, sports, of course. So when I went back to um, Palestine, I had been away for about 19 years. Um, it was in 2001. And my daughter was quite young at that time, so playgrounds were a really big part of our lives. Our, so, you know, I had that in my in my mind, um, in my consciousness. So, walking through the West Bank in Jerusalem, one of the, the absence of playgrounds was really glaring and obvious to me. And um, kids had really no place to play but you know the streets. And and that's another problem. Another thing that Israel's doing is by confiscating more and more agricultural land and pushing Palestinians more and more into these densely populated urban areas, um, there are no more open spaces really that are available for kids to just kind of go and just you know play and run around, um, which even limits children further and sort of creates this um, almost like sense of, of imprisonment. Uh, so. I would find these the I would find these open lots that were full of rubbish and and rocks and and stuff and just sort of imagine putting a playground there. And when I went back to the U.S., I had this idea. Okay, well, I'm, we're just gonna gonna start this thing called Playgrounds for Palestine. I had no idea what I was doing, you know. I, I, as with anything, I just sort of jump into things without thinking and. Most of the time I regret it, you know, but occasionally I stumble onto something and, and do, do something right. Um, uh, and this was one of them. It was, uh, you know, I, um, 
I just I, I put up a website I taught myself some basic things on how to make a website I did that and then I discovered that I had to fill out all kinds of forms for the IRS to be a nonprofit and I discovered that I had to pay them and uh, so it was one thing after another but you know I was already so deep into it and uh, I just kept on and and um, I couldn't get anybody on board at first everybody thought I was crazy and I was able to convince a, um, a playground manufacturer to donate a playground to us um, and then I, uh, I found a way to get the playgrounds there I found a space for it and um, and once we built that first playground uh, you know it gave us some legitimacy and I was able to recruit more board members and we had fundraisers and we've been going ever since. Okay, so, so I have to yeah. ask you to hold the thought there. We have to go for the break and when we come back, we'll go on okay, further. Great. So we'll see you after the break. Welcome back to the second segment of Finding Me on the ITV Networks. Today with me is Susan Abulhawa, the author of Mornings in Janine. And before we went on the break, we were speaking about the idea that developed, um, that Susan had, and of course, which she developed on, and that was about creating playgrounds for the children in Palestine. And uh, Susan, as you were speaking, I was just picturing those empty lots and, and the rubbish and I was all the damaged buildings. I mean, this week ITV has shown a lot of the documentaries, you know, in Janine and Palestine, Jerusalem, etc. And of course, for many of us who sat glued to the TV during Operation Castlet, etc., we, we can all vividly see those images. And you see how the children actually play on top of the ruins. Mm -hmm. And in most of the documentaries, they will show you a little teddy bear or a little doll, something, you know, within the ruins. So has this made a profound uh, difference to the lives of the children? Do they find yeah. joy in just the, a small, a small yeah. little gift like a playground that so many take for granted? Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we wouldn't still be doing it if it wasn't making a difference for for the kids, and that's that is where the difference is. It's in it's in their um, in in their young lives. Um, it's not you know it's not uh, bringing Palestine back. It's not changing the world or anything. But it is giving a a a, a refuge of sort to kids who really need a space of their own, yeah. um, to kids who are uh, traumatized in some ways who um, have, uh, who are cramped in, in urban areas, who don't have a space of their own. So yes, it does make a difference in their lives. And also, I think, um, you know, beca because of the way uh, the, um, the West Bank is in Gaza, there's, it, the, the hues tend to be gray, grayish, brownish hues. Mm -hmm. And so we intentionally kind of make the playgrounds this burst of color like you know oranges greens and so you end up having this sort of bright spot in an otherwise sort of drab sort of cement colored infrastructure and it makes a difference I'm told maybe the parents have told me that you know it's just so nice we look at it and there's they color feel good. right yes, yeah. right so it, it just having that colorful infrastructure I think makes a difference I can imagine now mornings in Janine was your first novel and it was it has been published or is being published in 19 countries and according to the Sunday Times it is the first English uh, language novel to express fully the human dimension of the Palestinian tragedy but my question is that after 60 years of occupation the Palestinian narrative is only now beginning to reach the people in the West and it had to be told in the language of the foreigners in order to allow them to fully understand the Palestinian problem or the Palestinian issues. And of course, then to challenge their very governments who are supporting Israel um, and continuing the, the occupation of the Palestinian people. And in, in, in one of your biographies or one of the biographies that was written, it said that Hanan Ashrawi, Ashrawi read your first essay and she said, we need such a narrative. So how important is creative expression in stimulating thought and changing perspectives in the West? So um, this idea of narrative is something that I actually think about quite a bit and something I've written about quite a bit. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And um, chief among them is that, you know, initially uh, the people who conquered Palestine were themselves Westerners and um, they, they spoke in the language um, and the nuances of Western culture. So um, on, one le on that level, it made sense that their version, their, their narrative is what reached the West initially. But it also happened to be um, a romantic story that the West wanted to hear, 
to assuage its guilt. So the first narrative was a land without a people for a people without a land. And, um, and that, that prevailed uh, and was reinforced by um, propaganda novels like, the, like Exodus. Um, and, but it wasn't until, you know, during that time, Palestinians sort of were going from one country to another, one court to another, sort of begging, you know, what do we do? We need to go back, you know, just this kind of um, just being lost and not knowing what to do and being incredulous that suddenly their country was pulled out from under their feet. And it wasn't until the Palestinians started hijacking planes that uh, the world said, "Oh wait, Palestinians do exist after all." I mean, that was that was the our you know our introduction, the to world's the introduction world. to the world's introduction to us, um, and so. But yet at that time, we still weren't controlling our own narrative in the West. Of course, we had our own writers um, who wrote in Arabic and um, and in the nuances of of Arab culture. Um, and, you know, as a reaction, the, uh, it, the narrative became, oh, they're terrorists, they want to kill us all. But, you know, so, so there was, there was this um, evolution of, of our narrative over time. It was action and reaction. And so now we arrive at a point where so many Palestinians have grown up in the West, in the diaspora, and now, you know, we can articulate our own narrative in, in their languages. Okay, so we'll have to go to the break, and when we come back, We'll take this a little further, so I'll see you after the break. Welcome back to the final segment of Finding Me on, IT, on the ITV networks. And this is the final segment of episode one with Susan Abdelhawa, the author of Mornings in Janine. Uh, Susan, before we went into the break, you were speaking about how the par uh, Palestinian narrative has come onto the scene. And, and I think what is important to me is that you chose to write Mornings in Janine using the Nakba as a central theme. And of course, the, the essence of the Nakba is to systematically eradicate everything that stands for, that the Palestinians stand for, in terms of their culture, their language, their history, their identity. And, and f to fulfill the prophecy of a land for, for, uh, for a people, you know, a land without people for a people without land. So, um, and it's similar to what the South Africans went through and the same kind of a story. Um, what are your thoughts on the Nakba and how would you like South Africans to understand it? Um, well, you know, the, the Nakba is, um, as you rightly said, it's really kind of the first phase in this um, campaign of ethnic cleansing to erase, erase our presence from the land. Um, and it, it isn't just, it hasn't just been the forcible removal of the indigenous population. It has also been sort of the, the wholesale destruction of our archaeological artifacts um, and appropriations of everything from our clothes to our food. And, you know, I think there's even like a, a, a blue and white kafia now with the Star of David. You know, it's, it's this, this uh, you know, there's Israeli hummus. I mean, this, this, uh, these, all these absurdities that really are just sort of an appropriation of another society's culture. Because Israel is, a, it's a manufactured state. It's a manufactured culture. The whole idea that um, you know s Europeans are returning three thousand years later to, uh, to 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 Palestine is um, is is really uh, it's it's a bit surreal. Um, absurd is is kind of a uh, is a light way to say it, but um, and I always always try to make the comparison or the analogy that you know the same claim using that same logic one could say well they, why don't they return to Egypt you know they there's they have the same kind of history in Egypt and imagine. Um, you know, uh, European Jews and American Jews and Russian Jews going to Egypt and uh, forcibly removing Muslim and Christian Egyptians. It's the same, it's the same idea. Um, and it's, uh, uh, in doing it in Palestine is just as cruel and, and absurd. Yes, and, and I, from what I was looking at through about your life, it says that you were born in Kuwait that you lived at the Daryl Tifli orf orphanage, uh, mm -hmm. and this orphanage has been immortalized in the film Mir Miral, and this is in Jerusalem. And you lived there for three years before moving to the US at the age of 13. But of course, what struck me about your biography was the fact that you said you hardly had time with your parents, that you lived in foster care, mm -hmm. and that as a result, you said, I have mostly felt my way through life. Mm 
Mm. Um, you know, for those of us who have everything, and literally we do, we have everything because if you have stability and you have peace, you have everything, mm -hmm. then you basically just go through life doing things, but you don't go through life feeling things. So can you perhaps share some of your thoughts with us about this, about feeling your way through life? Um, well, what I talked about earlier about, you know, starting p Playgrounds for Palestine is, is kind of an example of that. Um, when I, uh, when I decided to write this book, um, you know, I, I felt strongly that I wanted to write this, um, uh, this novel, uh, and it was kind of a, um, I had to make some, what people would think were very foolish decisions to do that. Um, including, you know, mortgaging my house because I wasn't working and, and going into massive debt, um, which is, you know, when I think back, I mean, as a single mother, that was a huge risk to take. But, um, it, I mean, those are sort of examples, I guess, of feeling my way through life. I just kind of, um, you know, going through life without adult guidance, um, you just kind of uh, learn to do things by trial and error. You develop your own sort of value system um, in that way as well. And I think we have to leave it there. We are going to close it. And then what we'll do is that in the, for the second episode, I'm going to take you through the Palestinian narrative, of course. And, and I want to talk a little bit more about the political issues uh, revolving around, around Palestine, Gaza, and of course, you being an American Palestinian. So um, we're going to say goodbye for this episode. And inshallah, for the second episode, I'd like you to stay tuned. And then we'll raise the further, uh, these further discuss, uh, discussions and discourses um, in the episode in episode two of Finding Me. So, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.